Hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. This is an educational channel. And uh, we look at uh, theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, really anything that I think that um, can really benefit your life in life-changing ways, uh, paradigm shifters, and um, things that will help you out with your 5D Awakening. Today is our 462nd video on Dewey B. Larson and his reciprocal system of theory. And um, Larson proposed his two fundamental postulates back in 1959. And uh, this is just two sentences about how he believed the universe operated. And then he elaborated his postulates into um, a theoretical universe through a long process of deduction, process of if this, then that, um, and um, then took his theoretical universe and compared it with um, the measured universe of the legacy scientists. We are looking at the results of one of those uh, studies right here, uh, one of his books on chemistry, Basic Properties of Matter. And in this book, he uh, arrives at equations, derives through deduction, equations uh, for many of the basic properties of matter, like the melting point and the specific heat. And uh, then he compares them with the scientific tables that have already been, been published. Uh, so we're going to take a look at this um, uh, picked up right in the middle of the chapter 7 on uh, temperature relations. Uh, before we do that, let's do a quick once over on the reciprocal system, which is also known as the universe of motion. Larson attempted to build his universe upon motion. His first postulate reads, the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so uh, Larson builds his universe out of motion. Now that has been uh, attempted before by people like Descartes and Hobbes, but they never succeeded uh, because they didn't define motion specifically as the relationship between space and time. And um, now when you have a universe of motion really the first thing that you need to understand is that motion comes first. In a universe of motion, um, you have motion before you have anything moving. So um, you have to be able to accept the concept of motion without anything moving. And uh, that is really what Larson calls the progression of the natural reference system. This is the omnipresent, eternal, um, you know, at every location and at all times, um, there is this underlying motion that is always there. And that is really the source of everything else. So we got to start with that. Now, when Larson is referring to motion, He's referring specifically to a kind of motion that he calls scalar motion. And a scalar motion, it's known by science, and you know, but it is not emphasized by science. They kind of put it into, um, you know, sweep it under the rug a little bit. But a scalar motion is a motion with a magnitude, but no specific direction. So, uh, you can visualize a scalar motion with a balloon that you put dots on. If you blow up the balloon, all the dots will be moving away from each other, but in no specific direction because 
every dot will be moving away from every other dot. And indeed, every location on the surface of that balloon will be moving away from every other location. Meaning that every dot is moving in every direction. There's no specific direction, it's moving in all directions. And uh, this is what Larson calls the progression, this outward motion of the balloon. Uh, and um, if you suck in the balloon and uh, you contract it, all the dots will be moving toward each other. And Larson refers to this as gravitation. Now, um, Larson defines motion as the relationship between space and time. Basically, motion is a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. Um, the most simple example of motion would be speed. The bike is going 10 miles per hour, 10 miles of space in one hour of time. Space over time is speed. And that is a reciprocal relationship between space and time. If you double the speed, you can say the bike is now going 20 miles per hour. Or if you, you can also equivalently say the bike is now going 10 miles per half hour. You can double the space or have the time um, and vice versa. That is a reciprocal relationship. And um, Larson extrapolates from speed and says, well, speed is a kind of motion and it is a relationship between space and time. But I say that all kinds of motion are relationships between space and time. That is all of our scientific phenomena are relationships between space and time. So he's talking about matter and energy and power and force and momentum, surface tension, electric charge, magnetic permeability. These are all forms of motion and they are all uh, can be identified with their time space um, coordinates, so to speak. Um, like matter, matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. Um, force is time over space to the second power. Acceleration is space over time to the second power. And so on. So now you have a, a ref, you know, a, a system of units that is uh, superior to the MKS system because it's only using two variables instead of three. You get rid of the mass, and now you just have time and space only. And so uh, it makes your units a lot more easy to keep track of. Okay, now space and time have uh, space, time, and motion all come in three dimensions. Now we can see three dimensions of space, obviously, in our environment. Uh, Larson calls this coordinate space, X, Y, Z coordinates, up, down, left to right, and forward and back. These are three dimensions of space in a still frame. And at the same time, we are moving through time. Uh, we are progressing through time. Time is always getting later and later and later and later. Larson refers to this as the spatial reference system, coordinate space and clock time. And that's the spatial reference system. By the reciprocal postulate, there must also be a temporal reference system. And in this temporal reference system, we would see the same with space and time interchange. So we're going to be able to see coordinate time, three dimensions of time in a still frame uh, with, um, you know, 
uh, space-like directions. Not the same, but space-like directions. And uh, clock space. Space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart, like on the surface of an expanding balloon. And that is what Larson calls the temporal reference system. And neither one of these reference systems is sufficient. In fact, both of them together are not sufficient uh, because it only takes one dimension of um, motion to describe three dimensions of space or three dimensions of time. We only need one dimension of motion to describe them. So there are two other dimensions of motion that are still available for, um, you know, three-dimensional motion. So the reference systems are not going to be able to account for uh, three-dimensional motion. Now, um, if you have um, space and time and motion all coming in discrete units, um, you have to have a full unit of space before you have space. You have to have a full unit of time before you have time. Um, and if you don't have a full unit, you haven't got anything. If you have one unit of space in one unit of time, space over time being speed, then you have what Larson calls unit speed. All of our scientific phenomena come in units. So if you have a unit of mass, that would be, you know, um, time times time times time over space times space times space. And those would be, that would be your unit of mass. Um, turns out to be something like uh, 10 to the minus 30, 32 um, cubic, cubic uh, seconds per um, cubic centimeter or something like that. But um, all of our fundamental quantities come in units. And unit speed um, is the speed of the progression. So the progression is always progressing at one unit of space per one unit of time. One more unit of space per one unit of time, and so on and so on. And that uh, unit speed is also known as the speed of light. So the progression is moving outward at the speed of light in all directions, at all times, in all places. This is what Larson calls the progression of the natural reference system. So we have these artificial reference systems, spatial reference system and temporal reference system that are not sufficient in and of themselves. But we have this, we have this natural reference system, which is the actual reference system that nature conforms to. It's a moving reference system. It's always moving outward at the speed of light in all directions, from all locations in all times. And this is what Larson refers to as the null point or the zero point. Um, I don't think he's ever, I, didn't hear, I haven't seen him refer to it as a zero point, but the null point also as... Um, the state of rest in a universe of motion. So this is the empty universe. This is what you have when you don't have anything else. And this is the source of everything else. The source of everything is basically taking that outward progression and harnessing it by first reversing the outward motion. But again, it's in three dimensions, so it has to be reversed um, in three dimensions. It has to be first reversed and then it has to be rolled back. So you reverse it to where it's actually not moving in stationary, uh, according to a stationary reference frame, and then it has to be rolled back so that it is like the um, contracting balloon, gravitation. It's moving inward. Uh, all, of, all of the dots are 
moving toward each other. So gravitation is really like a minus one and the progression is like a plus one. Um, and so there is uh, what Larson calls the rotational base, the rotational equivalent of, of nothing. And this is what you get when you first, you, ha you reverse the um, progression. That first reversal is called the photon or light particle. And we still see the light particle as moving outward at the speed of light in all directions. Um, that's because it's only reversed in one dimension out of three. And then you can reverse it, uh, you can rotate that photon, and that photon has to be rolled back in three dimensions um, to get it to gravitate. And that is what Larson's periodic table is based on, um, this, um, these three numbers of the rotational motions and their magnitudes. So for example, oxygen, oxygen has three numbers. All elements have three numbers. Uh, the first is a primary two-dimensional rotation. The second is a secondary two-dimensional rotation. And the third is a um, optional one-dimensional vibration. So the third number can be zero uh, as in the noble gases, but it can be positive or negative as well. And the first two numbers alternate. So the, you know, the first number goes to the first spot and the second goes to the next spot, uh, to the second spot, and then back to the first spot and then back to the second spot. And so it builds up that way all the way up to uh, what Larson says, element 117, which would be notated as five, four, minus one. So, it can't go beyond five. And um, now when you do have matter, so you can have matter and cosmic matter, depending on whether you're reversing the progression in time or in space. So um, when you're reversing it in space, you have uh, what Larson calls the material sector. This is matter that is moving slower than the speed of light. Um, but you also have the cosmic sector where everything is moving faster than the speed of light. This is really unknown to science. They uh, have detected some of these cosmic atoms and cosmic molecules and they generally identify them as mesons or anti antimatter. Um, but in the material sector, if you have two atoms and they approach each other uh, to get to be one unit of space apart, remembering that space, time, and motion come only in discrete units, and the unit of space is approximately uh, two millionths of an inch, 4.56 times 10 to the minus 8 meters and um, once they approach each other to one unit apart they can't move any closer because you can't have less than one unit of space and so instead they start moving outward in time instead of space because they can't move in space and uh, when you move outward in time by the reciprocal postulate that is the equivalent of moving inward in space and we actually see it as inward in space because we can't see time we only see space because we're anchored to the spatial reference system because we're in a gravitationally bound system and so we see it in equivalent space and there's a few adjustments that you have to make for your uh, perceptual abilities to see into this, uh, what he calls the time region, the region inside one unit of space. This is the region of atoms and molecules, uh, particularly in the solid state. And um, the directions also reverse within the um, time region, as well as within the space region, which is the reciprocal of that over in the cosmic sector within one unit of time, you have only space. And so the same thing happens with the cosmic atoms and molecules over in the time region. But when you look across that boundary, 
the uh, rules invert again, and so now the progression is moving inward in equivalent space. Gravitation is moving outward. And um, that you're uh, are now able to establish an uh, interatomic equilibrium. Atoms uh, basically join together uh, in, in the geometrical bonding um, based on the equilibrium distance, which is where the progression equals gravitation. And um, the progression leads to phenomena that are based on uh, pressure, and gravitation uh, leads toward temperature. So those are kind of the two main forces that atoms deal with in the time region. And this is what Larson has been dealing with when he's been discussing this in this book uh, at the beginning here. Uh, he's done a chapter on compressibility and he did four chapters on heat. This is the third one called Temperature Relations. We're going to start reading here. Um, you might or might not understand most of this stuff. It, some of it is kind of technical and detailed, but I will try to uh, walk you through it. Uh, but you'll be confused about quite a few things. Don't let that worry you. You're really just trying to get the general ideas um, because the general ideas are what you can pass along to other fields. Remembering that this is a theory of everything. So you don't have to learn a whole new subject every time you switch subjects. You know, there's one general idea, one general system of understanding all subjects. Okay. If the thermal factors remain constant as they do in the regular pattern followed by such elements as silver in figure 5, there should be a transition to n equals 2 at this 126 K or Kelvin temperature, uh, which we talked about yesterday. And um, the specific heat above this point would follow the extension of a line from the initial level, 3.89 to 4.63 at 126 Kelvin. Now, um, just remember that the specific heat is really the efficiency of heat uh, addition. So um, how much one unit of heat is going to heat up, how, you know, how many degrees is it going to heat up a specific uh, substance? And every, every atom, every molecule has their own temperature. And it, they, each one of them follows a specific heat curve where it heats up, um, but there are transition points in, for each atom uh, where it switches to a new rotational factor. Um, and the, it, it basically makes it so that more heat comes in um, uh, or more temperature change for uh, a specific level of heat. And that is because uh, of statistics and that the atom is going to do whatever it can to avoid uh, going across the melting point because uh, the solid is a more probable state to be in. So the atom goes through various machinations in order to avoid crossing that boundary. But instead of continuing on a 482 factor basis, the thermal factors decrease to 462 at the transition point. These factors uh, correspond to a transition temperature of 108 Kelvin. The specific heat of the molecule um, that, yeah, okay, I understand. Okay. The specific heat of the molecule therefore undergoes an isothermal increase at 126 K to the extension of a line from the initial level of 3.89 to 4.63 at 108 Kelvin and follows 
this line at higher temperatures. The effect of the isothermal increase in the specific heat of the individual molecules is, of course, spread out over a substantial temperature range in application to a solid aggregate by the distribution of molecular velocities. The temperature of the subsequent transition points and the endpoints of the various segments of the specific heat curves can be calculated from the temperatures of the first transition points by applying the relative values listed in chapter 5 to the appropriate values of T sub 1, first transition point. An approximate agreement between the empirical data and the higher transition points thus calculated is indicated, but the angles at which the upper segments of the curves intersect are too small uh, to permit any close empirical definition of the temperature of intersection. The only one of the endpoints that has any real significance is the endpoint of the last segment of the curve applicable to the substance under consideration. This is the temperature unit of the solid, temperature limit of the solid, sorry. Any further addition of heat initiates the transition to the liquid state. Inasmuch as it is the individual molecule that reaches its thermal limit at the solid endpoint, it is the individual molecule that makes the transition to the liquid state. Physical state is thus basically a property of the individual molecule rather than a property of the aggregate as seen in conventional physical theory. The state of the aggregate is merely a reflection of the state of the majority of its constituents. Recognition of this fact some 40 years ago in the early stages of the investigation that led to the results now being reported was a major step in the clarification of physical fundamentals that ultimately opened the door to the formulation of a general physical theory, the reciprocal system. The liquid state has long been an enigma to conventional physics. As expressed by Weisskopf, quote, a liquid is a highly complex phenomenon in which molecules stay together yet move along each other. It is by no means obvious why such a strange object should, should exist. Weisskopf goes on to speculate as to what uh, the outcome would be if physicists knew the fundamental principles on which atomic structure is based, as present-day theory sees them, but, quote, had never had uh, occasion to see structures in nature, end quote. He doubts if these theorists would ever be able to predict the existence of liquids. In the reciprocal system of theory, on the other hand, the liquid state is a necessity, an intermediate condition that must necessarily exist between the solid and the gaseous states. When the thermal motion of a molecule reaches equality, with the inward progression of the natural reference system in one dimension of the region outside unit distance, the cohesive force in that dimension is eliminated. The molecule is then free to move in that dimension. Okay, so uh, when the thermal motion equals the um, cohesive force, then the co cohesive force is eliminated. And then the molecule is free to move in one dimension outside the time region. So that's the liquid, is one dimension outside the time region. The other two are still in the time region, whereas the solid is all three in the time region. While it is held in a fixed 
Uh, okay, so the molecule is then free to move in that dimension while it is held in a fixed position or fixed average position in the other dimensions by the cohesive forces that are still operative. The temperature at which the freedom in one dimension is reached is the melting point of the aggregate. Because any additional thermal energy supplied to the aggregate is absorbed in changing the state of additional molecules until the remaining, con uh, remaining content of solid molecules reaches the percentage that can be accommodated within the liquid aggregate. Okay, so keep in mind that um, this is called the uh, heat of fusion. So this is um, when you heat something up and it gets to the melting point, um, you know, whenever you're, as you're heating it up, every unit of heat that you put into it will heat up the, the uh, compound or the matter. Um, but once you get to the melting point, then you can add heat and the temperature will not go up. There has there is a certain amount of heat that is required just to, just for the change of state from the change from uh, from solid to liquid. Um, so there's that's what's called the heat of fusion, and the same thing occurs when you're uh, turning it into a gas. It, it actually more uh, more heat is needed for the heat of vaporization. Uh, so. That's, uh, that's what he's talking about here. Uh, additional thermal energy to the aggregate is absorbed in changing the state of additional molecules until the remaining con uh, content of solid molecules uh, reaches the percentage. Now remember, every molecule has its own temperature. So when you're talking about an aggregate of molecules, it's really based on the average temperature are really the percentage of the amount of atoms that are in the liquid state as opposed to in the solid state. I believe it's something like 30, if 30% 30 of the molecules are liquid, then we basically see the, um, we see the aggregate as a liquid. Um, in order for it to change from a solid to a liquid, really the the uh, atomic or the geometrical bonding needs to be undone. You know, you have to break the crystal lattice that's, you know, keeping the solid state uh, uh, aggregate in, in a crystal structure. Okay, so that's about how that works. We'll, we'll get back to uh, looking at some more of these phenomena tomorrow. Um, but thanks for tuning in today. And, uh, you know, keep hanging in there and uh, come back tomorrow.